Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk today about work we've been doing looking at immune correlates of protection from SARS-CoV-2 infection. Firstly, um, just to think more broadly about immune correlates and what we mean, because anytime we vaccinate someone or they get infected, they mount a variety of immune responses. These might be neutralizing antibody responses or non-neutralizing responses, and we induce T cell responses of different phenotypes. Clinically, we're most interested in um, protection, and protection might be measured uh, from acquisition of infection or uh, against severe infection. And we're interested in which of this sort of variety of immune responses that is induced can either predict protection or actually might mediate protection. And those needn't be the same things because uh, some responses might be quite predictive, um, even though uh, just because they're correlated with the other response, which is mechanistic. So for example, what is the evidence for neutralizing antibodies as a correlate of protection for SARS-CoV-2 infection? Well, firstly, going back uh, nearly 18 months now, as the results of the phase three clinical trials were coming out for the different vaccines, uh, we were interested to observe that if you looked at the immunogenicity in terms of the neutralizing antibody response from the phase two trials, on the x-axis, normalized to the convalescent subjects included in each of those trials. And you looked at the clinical protection from symptomatic infection reported in the phase three trials, you saw this very strong correlation. So to take this further, we were interested to think about you know, the mechanism that's underpinning that. So for example, anytime uh, you, you vaccinate a group of people, you expect a distribution in neutralization tiers. Um, as shown in the, the light blue uh, bell curve here. We assume that there's some relationship between neutralizing antibody teeter and protection, this purple curve, so that for any given distribution in antibody levels, we'll have some proportion of people who are not protected because they fall below the protective threshold. So can we use that sort of model to explain the data that we see across the different vaccine trials? So, for example, at the top, um, we've got uh, Moderna, and at the bottom, um, Coronavac and the convalescent subjects. And the blue curve represents the protected population and the distribution of their neutralizing antibody teeters. And this vertical blue line here um, is the protective threshold. And the red to the left is the proportion of this distribution that is not protected. And you can see across the seven different trials and the convalescent subjects that there's a common um, protective threshold that explains the proportion of people protected in each trial. And that turns out to be about 20% of the convalescent, the mean convalescent antibody teeter gives 50% protection. So <clears throat> now we can take that sort of mechanistic model and we can plot what it looks like um, on our relationship between neutralizing antibody teeter and protection. And just as we'd fitted this curve with the first uh, seven vaccines and convalescent subjects, the results of an eighth vaccine came out, Covaxin. And as you can see, it lies um, exactly on the line, which gave us great reassurance that um, neutralizing antibodies can actually be predictive of a vaccine protection against symptomatic infection. As I just mentioned, everything up to now has been talking about symptomatic infection, but there was also data on severe infection collected in some of the phase three trials. There was much less data because there were less than 100 severe cases across the different trials. But nonetheless, you can show that there's an association between neutralizing antibody TETA and protection from severe infection, and that a much lower antibody level is required to give protection from severe infection. And this has some implications because, for example, as we get waning of antibody levels or we get reduced antibody teeters with a variant, what we um, expect is that that'll mean that protection moves down the curve as indicated by these purple arrows, but you'll lose much more protection against symptomatic infection than against severe infection, um, simply because you're at different positions on the curves and they have different shapes. So this relationship predicts that protection against severe infection will be maintained better over time and also maintained better against the variants, which we um, see playing out now 
So how might we validate this curve with a different sort of data set? Well, one of the things is that there's this underlying assumption indicated by the figure on the right that individuals with a lower antibody TETA uh, will be more likely to get infection. And there have now been three studies um, looking at groups of vaccinated subjects and the antibody teeters in those that got infected versus didn't get infected. Um, these have been um, with the Pfizer vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. And they all showed the same thing that as predicted, the neutralizing antibody level is lower in those individuals um, who got infected. So that's great. Everything I've spoken about up to now has been looking at essentially vaccine protection against a homologous spike protein because the vaccine uses the ancestral spike and the infections I've described have been with the uh, ancestral-like um, spike. So can we still use this model to predict efficacy against the variants? So for example, when we look at the different variants, there tends to be a drop in neutralization TETA. Antibodies are less effective against them. In the case of the alpha variant, the drop was 1.6 fold, right down to the Omicron variant where it's greater than 10 fold. So can we adjust our um, curve and still predict efficacy? So on the left is the curve I've shown you about the ancestral. And on the right, that's now in gray and the colored dots are the predicted neutralizing antibody teeters, taking into account the drop in teeter to the variants and the reported efficacies. So for example, for Novavax against the alpha variant, we dropped the teeter 1.6 fold and you can see the um, efficacy reported there. And similarly for the beta variant, dropped the teeter 8.8 fold. And you can see that across sort of these different vaccines and variants, the model remains predictive of vaccine efficacy. So, um, so far, uh, everything we've looked at is, is indicating that neutralizing antibodies are predicting protection. But is there evidence that they actually mediate protection? Um, and for example, if we were to give antibodies alone, would they be able to do it? Or is it, do they need T cells and other mechanisms? Well, of course, we have quite a number of passive antibody studies where people administered either convalescent plasma or um, purified um, hyperimmune immunoglobulin from that convalescent plasma or monoclonal antibodies, and then looked at the ability of these to protect against infection. So we were interested in whether, um, given that we know that these treatments work, whether they were at doses and times that were relevant to what's happening after vaccination. So for example, with monoclonal antibody treatment, um, here <clears throat> we're arranging the data from all of the um, uh, randomized control trials of monoclonal antibodies up to March this year. Um, on the x-axis, you can see the uh, stage of infection uh, when the monoclonal was administered. So there are some studies which were of true pre-exposure prophylaxis and others were therapeutic studies, for example, of treating symptomatic infection. Um, as you can see, um, clearly the earlier the treatment, the better. And when you look at um, prophylactic treatment, you can get up to 93% protection, which is very similar to what we see um, in vaccine protection. However, the later we treat, by the time you get to treating hospitalized uh, individuals, you see very little protection. But what are the doses um, that are given and are they relevant to what we see in vaccination? So we were interested to take um, treatment of symptomatic individuals looking at the outcome of hospitalization, because that was where there was the most data and ask if we can understand the dose response curve here. <clears throat> so for example, here um, on the x-axis, I've got the dose administered divided by its dilution effect um, when you give it to the subject against efficacy um, for the different trials of treatment of symptomatic individuals looking at the outcome of preventing hospitalization. You can see on the left, um, there's a number of uh, results from uh, convalescent plasma trials and on the right um, from different monoclonal antibody trials. And now we can fit the same curve um, that we fitted for the uh, vaccines to look at the dose response. Um, when we do this, we find that there seems to be a maximal efficacy that if you treat symptomatic patients, you can't get more than about 70% efficacy in preventing hospitalization. We can also estimate that EC50, which is the dose um, of antibody that gives 50% of the maximal protection. 
And that turns out to be about 19% of the convalescent teeter. And that was a little surprising to us that that's so similar to the um, uh, IC50 that was estimated for the vaccines. Um, we, we thought you might need a much larger dose in um, a therapeutic setting. And clearly um, other people have thought that as well, because when you look at the EC90, the, the dose required to give 90% of the maximal protection, you find that that's actually a pretty small dose. Um, it's uh, only about five to 50 milligrams of monoclonal, for example. And when you look at the different uh, studies of monoclonal antibodies, they've given up to eight grams. So they've given between seven and a thousand fold what we estimate as the EC90. So we could probably get away with a lot less. So I think that's fairly good evidence that neutralizing antibodies both predict protection and actually mediate protection when you give them a single agent. And it's around this time that someone always asks the question, what about T cells? Um, are they also protective? And we were very interested to think about the evidence for that, because clearly T cells are important for providing help to B cells in making good neutralizing antibody responses. But is there evidence that they act directly to protect either against the acquisition of infection or against severe infection? Now, it can be difficult to look at T cells because we don't have any sort of uh, good assays that are wide, uh, used in a widespread way. Everyone uses their own assays. We also tend to measure T cells in blood, whereas we think maybe T cells in lung are important. Also, T cell responses are correlated with antibody responses. So um, we might see them associated with protection, even though they're not mechanistic, they're just correlated with neutralizing antibodies. So to get around that, um, one way to do it is to look at the variants. That is because the variants have evolved to escape neutralization. You know, as I mentioned before, they have a drop of, you know, up to tenfold um, neutralizing antibody TETA compared to the ancestral and compared to the vaccine, whereas the T cell recognition remains relatively intact for most of the variants. So we can ask the question, for example, that, you know, when you get infected with a variant, does protection follow the drop in antibodies or the maintenance of T cells. And this is an example from a um, recent a review in Nature Reviews Immunology. Um, so for example, the beta variant has a large drop in neutralizing antibody TETA um, compared to the ancestral, but T cell recognition is maintained. And the protection against acquisition of infection drops with the drop in neutralizing antibody TETA, as you'd expect. What about severe infection? So uh, there's a thought that T cells might be important here. Um, well, it's a little bit complicated just to look at risk of severe infection because you have to get symptomatic infection first. So if neutralizing antibodies protect against symptomatic infection, then they'll also be seen to protect against severe. So what we might be more interested in is if you have symptomatic infection, um, what protects you against severe infection? I've already shown you that in passive antibody studies, they can mediate this, um, but is there evidence that T cells do it? Um, and so this is a study by Nyberg and colleagues um, in the UK, uh, looking, comparing vaccine efficacy against um, the Delta variant and against the Omicron variant. And what they found was that there was higher vaccine protection against the Delta variant for different vaccines, and in this case, at different times after vaccination. And that's consistent with the fact that there's better neutralization against the Delta than the Omicron, so higher protection. And it's inconsistent with the fact that T cell recognition of Delta and Omicron are the same. So suggesting that um, T cells uh, are not acting to prevent protection from symptomatic disease to hospitalization. So I'll leave it there, uh, but I think there's very good evidence that neutralizing antibodies both um, predict and mediate protection I think there's an ongoing um, search for other co-correlates, but as yet, I don't think we have any convincing evidence. And I'll thank those who contributed to the, to the study, um, in particular, David Khoury and uh, Deborah Cromer um, in my group, and also our colleagues in Australia and around the world and our funding bodies. Thank you very much.